inventor, author of Words I'm Not Allowed to Say, Corey Schrader, age nine, says, I did a book report on the first issue and got an A. The, the story has a very Beatle-esque Beatle setup and is literally described as a storyboard for an upcoming feature film. We have issue one and two available for free in promotion of their upcoming tour produced by Rebel Salmon Media. And where can you get that free stuff? Over at the canopy. That away, over on Court Street. Woo. All right. Our next performer, um, Michael asked me last evening um, for sure if this performer was going to be here because he was very much looking forward to seeing her perform. <laughs> and indeed she is. Um, she describes her poetry as broken doll hands that had to grow new fingers. Please welcome Juliet Cook.
closer and closer to death. And so loneliness scares us closer and closer to love. Many of us trash dull utensils. A cracked glass, half empty or half full, doesn't matter as long as it can be replaced with a different, better half. As long as we can fill up our own broken parts with someone else's. Turn me off. I felt you pulling me out. I've turned from cool water to old pond scum inside your mind. Or maybe old tree bark that you know still exists, but who wants to keep swimming in something cracked, deep and sticky, when they can get something younger, rootless, easier to handle? Easier to toss around, easier to convince that you know more than you do, brighter than me, tighter than me, many times lighter than what's inside me and you. The only time you ever want to talk to me is when you're wasted and having issues with her. You'll complain about her and flirt with me, but if she comes back to your place unexpectedly, then you'll stop mid-flirt, hang up on me, yet still expect me to be there for you next time. She's out the door, and you're in the mood to recharge your on and off dick switch inside my hollow hole, trying to rip off more of my branches. All right, three more. This one is called Blood on the Unpillowed Cases. Their lightning bolts shiver to the core, shimmy in the gore. You want to see what happens if you get me down on the floor. I didn't say my mood was war. I said it was a worm working its way out of me. Occasionally, I think maybe the delusional sparks of me have outweighed the good. My fireworks are not even in control of the red blood cells turning into glowing alien spaceships dripping down. An onslaught of tiny strobe lights of red snow hitting my windshield. Three dead birds on top of my head had wanted to fly inside my brain, but never made it past the cracked hat. The best I can do is drift in different directions. God complex. He repeatedly rails against other people's flaws, but if you point out one of his, he acts like you're torturing God. <laughs> and how dare you poke a tiny hole into his body of toxicity. Then it reaches the point where he's cracked so many old eggshells that the whole room is bleeding with hydrogen sulfide gas, and you can hardly breathe without screaming, but it's somehow all your fault for finally throwing all the broken shards into the trash. All you know is you can't handle any more sharp, stinging shells flung anywhere near you. So no matter whose fault it is or isn't, you start shoving every egg down into the trash compact you won't let him force any more of them down your throat. <laughs> All right, so this is my last one. Thanks for listening. Thanks for inviting me to be part of the reading. And thanks to everyone else for being invited. This one's called Cicadas Often Trample Each Other. How can I make cicada wings stay on a canvas. How can I make anything stay? Except for acrylic paint, yarn, paper words, and then I either give it away or throw it into a field of broken draft horses. Or keep it inside my own space 
and keep looking at this thing I created that nobody else understands. Wings and body are most vulnerable when they are still soft. If you want to make them last, if I want to make them last, I might have to harden them, cover them with more wet red, and then wash them dry. Thank you very much, Juliet. Let's give it to Juliet. All right, and we have some music coming up next. Um, so Josie McGee uh, will, bring, will be bringing us original music that is not confined by specific genre borders. Please welcome Josie McGee.
little bit of a slower jam.
I haven't heard its tone in years. But now, eyes blinking and confused, there is no sand, no sun, no warm wind stinging at my cheeks. In the mixed glow of a quarter moon and red alarm, I search the corners of my room. But I see no threat, no danger, only a ceiling fan buzzing low and sheets heavy binding at my ankles. To my left, mounted to the wall, my gun rack, made of oak and cherry when I was a boy. The different calibers make shadows like fingers reaching out for me. Under my mattress sticks a blade fixed to a wooden handle, and at time I test its angle, try the slicing steel. I feel for it before I sleep. But on these nights, when thunder creeps in from the west and shakes these walls, pulling me from my past, I reach for the pistol on my nightstand, feel its weight, its power, its comfort. I pull the slide to the rear, let it go, hear the clink of metal on brass and chamber around. I imagine the cavities in your chest, blood, flesh burnt, pearl shards of bone, life smoking from your holes, death, justice. Then, barefoot and shirtless, I walk this house armed into the morning sun. This is just water. <laughs> wait, wait. No, it's just a game like that. Alright, this one uh, is probably. We don't need introductions. Here we go. Right. <laughs> Humanity. How could you not see that I was dying? stumbling by with a loaded bottle to my brain, speaking to you in whispers about me in tongues, dragging my anger behind me like a dead dog on a leash. I was tall when I was crawling, but you stepped right over me like a crack in the sidewalk. Shout out to one of my ex-girlfriends. <laughs> giving up, giving out. She wasn't nearly as pure after the breakup, pouring around like those Facebook love affairs that we would often shake our heads about. I tried to keep in touch on drunk nights, but I knew that she was gone, sucked into the thrills of non-believers. I hated her for that for giving up on the woman that she wanted to become, for fucking away the future that we often talked about over a full glass of blackberry wine under those autumn sparklers while rubbing her thigh and wishing for forever. But forever always comes too soon. We were young souls and aging bodies, lost in the excitement of something new. But we knew. We knew that love was sour, the light was quite bitter after the sugar coating, but we kept sucking anyway, and now that's how she forgets about me. <laughs> how to hold your head up. Stop watching where your feet go. Aimless steps into the shadows of a burnt out hallway light, too high to reach too high to care. Tripping over ankle hurdles placed there by a careless moon, gilded in the darkness for the lost to find. Armored and shiny for your curses and flying stones. Aim high when you're desperate. Pop shots at the moon, at the sun, both too bright for your dark thoughts. Angry haymakers wild at a wall that is there to hold up the shell that you are. And now, you swing holes into it, like a lunatic, aiming to break, you shatter. Cold on the dark floor, you look up for help. <laughs> We're getting to the good ones. It happens. <laughs> Uh, 
How alive are we? How alive are we, the living? The ones late side smiling, raised, cold, koozie, wet from our warming bush lights condensation in the 845 fading of a summer sky. Red in the cheeks and sparkling, damp neck collar from doting the fire blazing in the sinking shadows, where later we will get for private consultations about the moments where we feel most beating. I'm alive, you will scream, flashing pale tints of sunburned tan lines as you splash down into the moon ripple water in me. A personal favorite. Tequila by 10. <laughs> it's no surprise that we, I'm gonna start that over. That was dramatic build up there. All right, tequila by 10. It's no surprise that we didn't bother getting dressed. We are more alive when we are uncovered. And how wild we are drunk dancing to the rhythm of deep laughter. Your bare breasts tango in the morning light. I simply cannot get enough of the woman that you are. Body shots of a tequila sunrise. And in my eyes, you are everything. You guys are the first ones to hear this one, by the way. Ooh, All right, it's called uh, This Isn't About You. I write for me, but to read to you, and then judge you for judging me. <laughs> I write to taste life, language, to hold these words between tongue and cheek, sucking out the bitter juices of gnarled up vocabulary. I write for attention, my attention, as it so often drifts towards you. But I pull it back again with run-on sentences about undressing you with my eyes and then my hands and then touching you with my fingertips because I want you and I want to be with you because I need you because you are everything to me. And there it goes, off again, to the curves and refractions of your pale ass flexing in the door open hallway light. But this isn't about you, not yet. I write for me. It's the I in the stanza that stands out. Like a river in the desert, or palms giving shade to those in hell, I walk the dirt roads back to my childhood. Back when trees were giants that I would slingshot to the top, Back when blood and sticks and bark made forts for the day. I played army, but never died because I knew magic. And now, out loud, this monotone sound of me trying too hard to read like a poet covers up the redneck in my voice. I was once told that I say the number nine wrong by a girl from Indiana. We spent the rest of vacation correcting each other's accents on a towel in the sand. And maybe you don't understand, but I was always one to be in love with us. Even so, as I lay here sprawled out, bare naked, in front of you again, my chest and stomach hair gone, so that at the proper shadows of light, you can just make out the four-pack that I've been working so hard on for the last two months. And if I keep it flexed just right, perhaps you won't notice the case of bush light that I crushed around the fire with the guys last night. Right. Hi, I'm Azrael Johnson. Showcase over at Kathleen Allen Theater from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock at Barcelona. Um, our last feature might go a little over, um, but it'll be for fun. Um, uh, yeah. um, I'll remind you we are selling uh, dollar coffee and dollar water. It's not like quality a dollar, it's just for coffee. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, it's, out of, it's out of a cure, so it's going to be good. Um, also, I want to remind you about the canopy down on Court Avenue, really close to Avenue Arts. We have some books down there. Uh, most of them are a dollar. Uh, most of the better ones are poetry, so they're more than that. Um, I think. What's that? Free stuff from Rebel Salmon Media. Yeah, there's free stuff from Rebel Salmon Media over there as well. <laughs> and there's some stuff from Poets Haven too. Uh, we got Mr. Poets Haven here um, if you want to buy anything. I think uh, Lorraine, if you like her set, she's got some stuff over there. Um, another person will not be named because I'm mad at them right now. That's the version. Um, <laughs> without further ado, our final performer is an upcycled artist, eats squash blossoms, and is co-host of Writing Man's events. Please welcome Skylark Bruce. Thank you. This woman braves the world each day with her own face on display. Another woman delights in dozens of hues to paint her skin for him. That woman slays up and down the corporate sheets and ladders. A different woman dedicates all waking and barely sleeping moments to home and family. Fighting for civil rights, cooking for hungry bellies, raising our voices, quieting our hearts, and these are just a few of the women's ways I know. We have countless styles of expression and impression. So it's no compliment when you, an uneducated man, declare me to be not like the other girls. Oh, you know, you don't start drama. <laughs> you are sincerely stupid for thinking that is praise. I am like other girls. Don't separate me from my sisters. I long for the resilience of black women fighting to keep their children alive. Someday, I may have the unquenched sexiness of women who use wheelchairs and the word selection of autistic poet women. Trans women who know their power comes from within. Ladies, I want to be like you when I grow up. I am like other girls, and other girls are like me. The creative problem solving of women experiencing poverty, the hope of girls who long to learn to read and have safe bathrooms. The strength of women who rise up over rapes and beatings and murder attempts. They prevail and we prevail because we are stronger and smarter than the nonsense in our way. But you have a point. I am not like black women because no stranger has mistaken me for a sex worker or turned me down for a job because of my skin color. I am not like Latinx women whose anger is diminished as spicy. I am not like transgender women because stepping out my door doesn't give others as much license to attack and kill. I am not like women who live with anxiety disorders defined by compulsive quadruple checking. I am not like the Pakistani girls who learn the alphabet in secret and pray not to be married off at 10 or 11 to a 60-year-old violent alcoholic. I am not like the girls and women who struggle to complete school over the wails of a dozen babies and absent partners. I am not like them, but we are all the same. We can all listen to and empower each other. We can amplify the voices of each unheard one. Because I am like the other girls, when I lend my privilege as leverage, when my benefits are shared, no one is free until we're all free. I am like the other girls. written 
family history of who was harmed in the bird's, bird's search for a life. My grandfather and great uncle who compiled it were Scandinavian Americans whose destiny was manifest. Later, they would return east to Pennsylvania and Ohio and never think once about the broken treaties, compulsory relocation, and attempts to destroy native cultures by stealing children. Their own children were safe, from others anyway. They could fuck up their kids in peace. 100 years ago, they said the howling North Dakota winds drove my great-grandmother to madness, a nice way of saying she was married to an abusive alcoholic, and living on a remote farm, a continent away from her blood relatives. Maybe she had no say in justice for mistreated peoples, and what guilt does nothing by itself, worse than nothing, when it centers the laments of the privileged. 100 years later, we try not to ignore their voices by default. It has made the 24-hour news cycle enough times. We all know the name Standing Rock, and we chant, water is life. But the only ones who have been restored so far are oil companies. <laughs> Your name is Theo. Theo Piglet, you were born on a factory farm. You were as classically cute as any other pink baby. You nuzzled up to your mother, tangled in the legs of your siblings. There was no room in the stall to run or jump. You caught a glimmer of sunlight, Theo, and you knew. You filled your belly with mother's milk. Hold on, sunshine, I'm coming. A human opened the stall door to give your mother her food. You wriggled out for his legs and shoom, you were gone. Running with the big pigs now. Hey, Rudy, you're the biggest hog I've ever seen. Where are we going? The grass and sun look more fun than that dark truck. I don't want to. The humans with sticks made all the pigs get on the truck. You can still see sunshine through the wall slats. Before long, the big bodies of your cousins and the sunshine made the truck hot. Hotter. Hottest. You collapse in the corner. Cousin Rudy stood over you, letting no 500-pound hog step on you. The truck stopped, and you put your nose through a, through a slot in the wall. A human put a water bottle up to your face, and you drank the most delicious water ever. The human was hauled away in handcuffs. You passed out again. When you woke up, everything was dark, and Rudy was gone. They were all gone. You stood up on wobbly legs. A human walked up and grabbed you. How did you end up at the slaughterhouse this soon? You arrived 480 pounds too soon, Theo, and the human didn't know what to do. Another human handed him a thick board and pointed to a nearby ditch. But size was on your side today, Theo, and the human couldn't. He drove your cousins to their deaths for his own living, but he couldn't kill you. Your age and size, if not your species, persuaded him. He gave you water and food and sat you on the seat bench next to him, in the truck. He didn't know who would give you a home, but he knew who would know. And tired though he was, he drove many extra miles to take you to the right place. Theo, in a few days, you came home. Not home to your mother, but home to your new brother Wilbur and joyful human parents. Here at the sanctuary, the sunshine dances with you. Every day, Theo, except when it's raining, and then you dance because the mud puddles are everywhere. You dance, slide, and roll, and eat all the veggies. You tell your story to the smiling visitors and wiggle your tail at those not yet sure. Theo, speciesism wanted you dead. Ageism and sizeism saved you, but you're safe now. Safe and protected always. May it be so for each one. Each one born on a factory farm. This has become one of my most requested pieces recently. You are not going to hell. You're not going to hell. Nobody is, and definitely not you. The capital C church tried to sell our souls back to us as frightened puppets. Each of us paying over and over. Their scam has run its course. We no
know the good news in each cell of our bodies. It has nothing to do with blood washing or obedience to a highly variable code. God has hidden God's self in the last place many would think to look, inside of us. Original sin lied to us, constructed a torturous narrative, and convinced most people to live fear into existence. But the mystics knew. The mystics recognized the face of God in each of us. They saw through the illusion that holy and human are separate. When in fact, we never stopped being love. The institution used words like heretic, false prophet, witch, and sinner to condemn those they could not control. But we are love, and we are not going to hell. We are the embodiment of the divine, each of us, whether we feel empowered or not. Sin is not doing bad things, it's any perception that separates us from knowing that God is in us and we are in God. We are love. They said that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. What they left out is, so are we. There is no angry God who must be appeased by a sacrifice to the death. There is only the spirit who longs for each one to know our true intended nature. We're not going to hell. We may create a hell for each other, but we also have the power to know each other. The divine in me recognizes the divine in you. How absurd that this notion seems Eastern instead of native to everywhere. So no, sweetheart, you're not going to hell. You cannot lose God's love because it is not conditional, no matter what they said. Now go and be love, because love is who you are. Thank you.